Okay, good afternoon. On behalf of Marshmont Public Library, the No Henry, it's it's me, Frank. So, so let's start in. I, I know people have been waiting, looking for this one, so. No, it's not Gift of the Mage either. You'll get that at the end of this whole show. So the Ransom of Red Chief. It looked like a good thing, but wait till I tell you. We we're down south in Alabama, Bill Driscoll and myself, when the kids, this kidnapping idea struck us. It was, as Bill afterwards expressed it, during a moment of temporary mental apparition. Well, we didn't find that out until later. There was a town down there, flat as a flannel cake, and called Summit, of course. It contained inhabitants of as, satis as self-satisfied a class of peasantry as ever clustered around a maypole. Bill and me had a joint capital of about $600, and we needed just $2,000 more to pull off a fraudulent town lot scheme in Western Illinois. We talked it over on the steps of the hotel. Fondness of children, says we, is strong in semi-rural communities. Therefore, and for other reasons, a kidnapping project ought to do better there than in the radius of newspapers that send out reporters out in plain clothes to stir up talk about such things. We knew that Summit couldn't get after us with anything stronger than constables and maybe some lackadaisical bloodhounds and a, and a dietary tube in the weekly farmer's budget. So it looked good. We selected for our victim the only child of a prominent citizen named Ebenezer Dorset. The father was respectable and tight. A mortgage fancier and a stern upright collection plate passer and forecloser. The kid was a boy of 10 with bar relief freckles and hair the color of the cover of the, of the magazine you buy at the train station. Bill and me figured that Ebenezer would melt down for a ransom of $2,000 to a cent. But wait till I tell you. About two miles from Summit was a little mountain covered with a dense cedar brake. On the rear elevation of this mountain was a cave. There we stored provisions. One evening after sundown, we drove in a buggy past old Dorset's house. The kid was in the, was in the street, throwing rocks at a kitten on the opposite fence. Hey, little boy, says Bill. Would you like to have a bag of candy and a nice ride? The boy catches Bill neatly in the eye with a piece of brick. That will cost the old man an extra $500, said Bill, climbing over the wheel. The boy put up a fight like a welterweight cinnamon bear, but at last, but at last, we got him down to the bottom of, of the buggy and drove away. We, we took him up to the cave and I hitched the horse in the cedar brake. After dark, I drove the buggy to the middle village, three miles away, where we where we'd hired it and walked back to the mountain. Bill was casting court plaster over the scratches and bruises on his, on his features. There was a fire burning behind the big rock at the entrance of the cave. And the boy was watching a pot of boiling coffee with two buzzard tail feathers stuck in his red hair. He points a stick at me when I come up and says, ah, cursed pale face. Do you dare to enter the camp of the Red Chief, the Terror of the Plains? He's all right now, says Bill, rolling up his, his trousers and examining some bruises on his shins. We're playing Indian. We're making Buffalo, Buffalo Bill's show look like magic lantern views of Palestine in the town hall. I'm old Hank, the trapper, Red Chief's captive. I'm to be scalped at daybreak. I Geronimo, that kid can kick hard. Yes, sir, the, that boy seemed, seemed to be having the time of his life. The fun of camping out in the cave made him forget that he was a captive himself. He immediately 
christened me Snake Eye, the spy, and announced that when his braves returned from the warpath, I was to be broiled at the stake at the rising of the sun. Then we had supper, and he filled his mouth full of bacon and bread and gravy and began to talk. He made a during dinner speech something like this. I like this fine. I've been camping out before, but I had a pet possum once, and I was nine last birthday. I hate to go to school. Rats ate up 16 of Jimmy Talbot's aunt's speckled hen's eggs. Are there any real Indians in these woods? I want more gravy. Does the tree, does the trees moving make the wind blow? We had five puppies. What makes your nose so red, Hank? My dad has lots of money. Are the stars hot? I whipped Ed Walker what, twice Saturday. I don't like girls. Who doesn't catch toes unless with a string? Do oxen make any noise? Why are oranges round? Have you got beds to sleep on in this cave? Amos Murray's has got six toes. A parrot can talk, but a monkey or fish can't. How many does it take to make 12? Every few minutes he, he would remember he was a pesky redskin and pick up his stick rifle and tiptoe to the mouth of the cave to rubber for the scouts of the hated pale face. Now and then he would let out a war whoop that made old Hank the Tripper shiver. That boy had built her eyes from the start. Red Chief, says I to the, to the kid, would you like to go home? Oh, what for? They don't have any fun at home. I hate to go to school. I like to camp out. You won't take me back home again, Snake Eye, will you? Not right away, I says I. We'll stay here in the cave a while. All right, says he. That'll be fine. I never had such fun in all my life. We went to bed about 11 o'clock. We spread down some wide blankets and quilts and put Red Chief between us. We weren't afraid he'd run away. He kept us awake for three hours, jumping up and reaching for his rifle and screeching, Hiss! Bird! In mine and Bill's ears, as the fancy crackle of a twig or the rustle of a leaf revealed to his young imagination the steady approach of the outlaw band. At last, I fell into a troubled sleep and dreamed I'd been kidnapped and chained to a tree by a ferocious pirate with red hair. Just at daybreak, I was awakened by a series of awful screams from Bill. They weren't yells or howls or shouts but, or whoops or yawps, as you would expect from a manly set of vocal organs. They were, they were simply indecent, terrifying, humiliating screams such as women emit when they see ghosts or caterpillars. It's an awful thing to hear a strong, desperate, fat man screaming in, the, in a cave at daybreak. I jumped up to see what the matter was. Red Chief was sitting on Bill's chest with one hand twined in Bill's hair. In the other hand, he held the, the sharp case knife we cut, used for cut, slicing bacon and he was industriously and realistically trying to take Bill's scalp, according to the sentence that had been pronounced on him the evening before. I got the knife away from the kid and made him lie down again. But from that moment, Bill's spirit was broken. He, he laid down on his side of the bed, but he never closed an eye again in sleep as long as the boy was with us. I dozed off for a while, but... Along toward sun, sun up, I remember that Red Chief had said I was to be burned at the stake at the rising of the sun. I wasn't nervous or afraid, but I sat up and lit my pipe and leaned against the rock. What are you getting up so soon for, Sam? asked Bill. Me, says I. Oh, I got kind of a pain in my shoulder. Thought sitting up would rest it. You're a liar, says Bill. You're afraid. He was to be burned at sunrise, and he was afraid he'd do it. And he would, too, if he could find a match. Ain't it awful, Sam? Do you think anybody would pay out money to get a middle end like that back home? Sure, I said. Roddy, kid like that is just the kind of the kids the parents going to dote on. Now, you and Red Chief get up and cook some breakfast while I go to the top of this mountain and reconnoiter. 
I went up to the peak of the little mountain, ran my eye over the whole vicinity. Over towards summit, I expected to see the sturdy yeomanry of the village armed with scythes and pitchforks, being the countryside for the dastardly kidnappers. But what I saw was a peaceful landscape dotted with one man's plowing, one man out plowing for a dun mule. Nobody was dragging the creek. No courtiers dashed hither or yon, bringing tidings of no news to the distracted parents. There was a sylvan attitude of someone sleepiness pervading that section of the external outward surface of Alabama that lay exposed to my view. Perhaps, says I to myself, it has not yet been discovered that the wolves have borne away the tender lambkin from the fold. Heaven help the wolves, says I. I went down the mountain to breakfast. When I got to the cave, I found Bill backed up against the wall, breathing hard, and the boy threatening to smash him with a rock half as big as a coconut. He put a red hot potato down my back, explained Bill, and then mashed it with his foot, and I boxed his ears. You got a gun about you, Sam? I took a, the rock away from the kid and kind of patched up the argument. I'll fix you, says the kid to Bill. No man has ever yet struck the red chief, but he got paid for it. You better beware. After breakfast, the kid takes a piece of leather with strings wrapped around it out of his pocket, goes outside the cave unwinding it. What's he up to now? Asks Bill anxiously. You don't think he'll run away, do you, Sam? No fear of it, says, says I. You don't seem to be much of a home buddy. But we've got to fix up some plan about the ransom. There don't seem to be much excitement around Summit on account of his disappearance. But maybe they haven't realized that yet that he's gone. As folks may be thinking he's spending the night with Aunt Jane or one of the neighbors. Anyhow, he'll be missed today. Tonight we, get, we must get a message to his father demanding the $2,000 for his return. Just then we heard a kind of a war whoop, such as David might have admitted when he knocked out the champion Goliath. It was a sling that Red Chief had pulled out of his pocket and he was whirling around his head. I dodged and heard a heavy thud and a kind of sigh from Bill, like a horse gives out when you take his saddle off. Black rock the size of an egg caught Bill just behind his left ear. <coughs> he, he loosened himself all over and fell in the fire across the frying pan of hot water for washing the dishes. I dragged him out and poured cold water on his head for half an hour. By and by, Bill sits up and feels behind his ear and says, Sam, you know how my favorite biblical character is? Take it easy, says I. You'll come to your senses presently. King Herod, he says. You won't go away and leave me alone here, will, will you, Sam? I went out and caught that boy and shook him till his freckles rattled. Now, if you don't behave, says I, I'll take you straight home. Now, are you going to be good or not? I was only funning, he says he sullenly. I didn't, didn't mean to hurt old Hank. Well, what'd he hit me for? I'll, I'll behave, Snake Eye, if you don't send me home, and if you let me play the Black Scout today. I don't know the game, says I. That's for you and Mr. Bill to decide. He's your playmate for the day. I'm going away a while on business. Now, you come in and make friends with him and say you're sorry for hurting him, or home you go at once. I made him and Bill shake hands, and I took Bill aside and told him I was going to Poplar Grove, a little village three miles from the cave, to find out what I could do about how the kidnapping had been regarded in the summit. <coughs> I also thought it best to send a letter to old man Dorset that day, demanding the ransom and dictating how it should be paid. You know, Sam, says Bill, 
I've stood by you without, without batting an eye in earthquakes, fire, flood, and poker games. Dynamite outrages, police raids, train robberies, and cyclones. I never lost, never lost my nerve yet till we kidnapped that two little skyrocket of a kid. He's got me going. You won't leave me alone with him, will you, Sam? I'll be back sometime this afternoon, says I. You must keep the boy amused and quiet till I return. And now we'll write that letter to old Dorset. Bill and I got paper and pencil and worked on the letter while Red Chief, with blanket wraps around him, strutted up and down, guarding the mouth of the cave. Bill begged me cheerfully to make the ransom $1,500 instead of $2,000. I ain't attempting, says he, to decry the celebrated moral aspect of parental affection, but we're dealing with humans, and it ain't human for anybody to give up $2,000 for that 40-pound chunk of freckled wildcat. I'm, I'm willing to take a chance of that $1,500. You can charge the difference to me. So, to relieve Bill, I seated, and we collaborated a letter that ran this way. <coughs> Ebenezer Dorset, Esquire. We have your boy concealed in a place far from Summit. It is useless for you or the most skillful detectives to attempt to find him. Absolutely, the only terms of, on which you can have him restored to you are these. We demand $1,500 in large bills for his return. The money to be left at midnight tonight in the same spot and in the same box as your reply, as in here and described. If you agree to the terms and you answer by writing us by a solitary messenger tonight at half past eight o'clock, <coughs> after crossing Owl Creek on the plain to on the road to Poplar Grove, there were three large trees about 100 yards apart, close to the fence of of the wheat field on the right-hand side. At the bottom of the fence post opposite the third tree will be found a small pasteboard box. The messenger will place the answer in this box and return immediately to the summit. If you attempt any treachery or fail to comply with our demands as stated, you will never see your boy again. If you pay the money as demanded, he will be returned to you safe and well within three hours. These terms are, fi are final, and if you do not accede to them, no further communication will be attempted. Signed, Two Desperate Men. I addressed this letter to Dorset and put it in my pocket. As I was about to start, the kid comes up to me and says, Oh, Snake Eye, you said I could play the Black Scout while you was gone. Play it, of course, says I. Mr. Bill, I'll we'll play it with you. What kind of game is it? I'm the Black Scout, says Red Chief. And I have to ride to the stockade to warn the settlers that the Indians are coming. I'm tired of playing Indian myself. I want to be the Black Scout. All right, says I. It sounds harmless to me. I guess Mr. Bill will help you foil the pesky savages. What am I to do, asked Bill, looking at the kids suspiciously. You are the horse, says Black Scout. Get down your hands and knees. How can I ride to the stockade without a horse? Better keep him interested, said I, until we get the scheme going. Loosen up. Bill gets down in all fours, and a look comes in his eye like a rabbit when you catch it in a trap. How far is it to the stockade, kid? He asks in a husky manner of voice. 90 miles, says the Black Scout. And you have to hump yourself to get there on time. Well, now! <laughs> Black Scout jumps on Bill's back and digs his heels into his side. For heaven's sake, says Bill, hurry back, Sam, as soon as you can. I wish we hadn't made the ransom more than a thousand. Say, you quit hitting me, you know, or I'll get up and warm you good. I walked over the Poplar Grove and sat around the post office and store talking to the chaw bacons that, that came in to, uh, to trade. One whiskerando tells me he hears someone is all upset on account of Elder Ebenezer Dorset's boy having been lost or stolen. 
That's all I wanted to know. I bought some smoking tobacco, referred casually to the price of black eyed peas, posted my letter, and came away. Postmaster said mail carrier would be by, come by an hour and take the mail to Summit. When I got back to the cave, Mill and the boy were not to be found. I explored the vicinity of the cave, risked a yield or two, but there was no response. So I lighted my pipe and sat down on the mossy bank to await developments. In about half an hour, I heard the bushes rustle and Bill wobbled out into the little glade in front of the cave. Behind him was the kid. Stepping, stepping softly like a scout with a broad grin on his face. Bill stopped, took off his hat, and wiped his face with a red handkerchief. The kid stopped about eight feet behind him. <coughs> Sam, says Bill, I suppose you'll think I'm a renegade, but I couldn't help it. I'm a grown person with masculine proclivities and habits of self-defense, but there is a time when all systems of egotism and predominance fail. The boy is gone. Let's send him home. All's off. There was martyrs in the old time that suffered death and rather than give up the particular graft they enjoyed. None of them was subjugated to such supernatural tortures as I've been. Now, I've tried to be faithful to our articles of depredation, but there came a limit. What's the trouble, Bill? I was rude, said Bill, 90 miles of the stockade, not bearing an inch. Then when the setter was rescued, I, well, I was given oats. Sand ain't a palatable self substitute. Then for an hour, I had to try and explain to him why there was nothing in holes, how a road can, can run both ways, and what makes grass green. I tell you, Sam, a human can only stand so much. I, I take him by the neck of his clothes and drag him down the mountain. On the way, he kicks my legs black and blue from the knees down. I've got to have two or three bites of my thumb and hand cauterized. But he's gone, continues Bill. Gone home. I showed him the road to summon and kicked him about eight feet nearer there at one kick. I'm sorry we'll, we'll lose the ransom, but it was either that or Bill Driscoll's to the madhouse. Bill is puffing and blowing, and there is, but there is a look of incredible peace and growing content on his rose peak features. Bill, says I, there isn't a heart disease in your family, is there? No, says Bill, nothing chronic except malaria and accidents. Why? <laughs> then you might turn around, says I, and have a look behind you. Bill turns and sees the boy, it loses his complexion and sits down plump on the ground and st starts to pluck aimlessly at grass with, and little sticks. For an hour, he's afraid of his mind. Then I, when I told him that my scheme was to put the whole job through immediately and we would get the ransom and be off by midnight if old Dorset fell in with our proposition. <coughs> so Bill braced up enough to give the kid a weak sort of smile and, and promised to play the Russian in a Japanese war with him as soon as he felt a little better. I had a scheme for collecting that ransom without danger of being caught by counterplots that ought to be commended to, to, to professional kidnappers. The tree under which the, the answer was to be left and the money later on was close to, to the road fence with a big bare field on all sides. If a gang of constables should be watching out for anyone to come for the note, they would see him a long way off crossing the fields or in the road. But no sorry. At half past eight, I was up in that tree, as well hidden as a tree toad, waiting for the messenger to arrive. Exactly on time, a half-grown boy rides up to the road on, on a bicycle, locates the pasteboard box, at the foot of the fence post, slips the folded piece of paper into it, and pedals away back towards summit. 
I waited an hour and then concluded the thing was, was square. Slid down the tree, got the note, slipped along the fence till I struck the woods and was back in the cave in another half an hour. I opened the note, got near the lantern and read it to Bill. It was written with a pen and a crabbed hand. And the sum and substance of it was this. Two desperate men. Gentlemen, I received your letter today by post in regarding to the in regard to the ransom you asked for the return of my son. I think you're a little high in your demands, and I hereby make you a counter proposition, which I am inclined to believe you will accept. If you bring Johnny home and pay me two hundred and fifty dollars in cash, and I agree to take him off your hands. You'd better come at night, for the neighbors believe he is lost. And I couldn't be responsible for what they would do to anybody who they saw bringing him back. Sincerely, Ebenezer Dorset. Great pirates of Penzance, says I, of all the... But I glanced at Bill and hesitated. He had the most appealing look in his eyes I had, that I ever saw on the face of a dumb or a talking brute. Sam, says he, what's $250 after all? We got the money. One more night of this kid will send me to a bed in Bedlam. Besides being a thorough gentleman, I think Mr. Dorset uh, is a spencer for, for making us such a liberal author. You ain't going to let the chance go, are you? Well, tell you the truth, Bill, says I. I think this, this little kid's gotten somewhat on my nerves, too. We'll take him home, pay, pay the ransom, and make our getaway. We took him home that night. We got him to go by telling him that his father had, had bought a silver-mounted rifle and a pair of moccasins for him. And we were going to hunt bears the next day. <coughs> it was just 12 o'clock when we knocked at Ebenezer's front door. Just at the moment when I should have been abstracting the $1,500 from the box under the tree, according to the original proposition, Bill was counting out $250 into, the door, into Dorset's hand. When the kid found out we were going to leave him at home, he started up a howl like a calliope and fastened himself as tight as a leech to Bill's leg. His father peeled him away gradually, like a porous plaster. How long can you hold him? asked Bill. I'm not as strong as I used to be, said old Dorset, but I think I can promise you 10 minutes. <coughs> Enough, says Bill. In 10 minutes, I shall be across the central, southern, and middle western states and be legging it trippingly for the Canadian border. And dark as it was, and as fat as Bill was, and as good a runner as I am, he was a good half a mile and a half out of summit before I could catch up with him. And that, that's our ransom of, of Red Chief. Let's see. Having a little fun, but I go into various sources of recordings just as how long these run. Ransom of Red Chief is According to one, it ran 15 minutes. Another said 27, that's close. Makes you wonder if the, the short recordings are they're talking like auctioneers. Uh, here's one I'm sure you haven't heard before. The Enchanted Profile. There are, there are a few Caliphases. Women are Scheherazades by birth, predilection, instinct, and arrangement of the vocal cords. The 1,001 stories that are being told every day by hundreds of thousands of vizier's daughters to their, <coughs> to their respective sultans. But the bowstring will get some of them yet if they don't watch out. I heard a story, though, of one lady caliph. 
it wasn't precisely an Arabian night story because it brings in Cinderella who flourished her dish rag in another epoch in, and country. So if you don't mind all the mixed dates, which seems to give it an Eastern flavor after all, we'll get along. In New York, there is an old, old hotel. You've seen woodcuts of it in the magazines. It was built, uh, let's see, at a time when there was nothing above 14th Street except the old Indian Trail to Boston and Hammerstein's office. Soon, the old hotel would be torn down. And as the stout walls are riven apart and the bricks go roaring down the chutes, crowds will gather at the nearest corners to weep over the destruction of, the, of a dear old landmark. Civic pride is strong in New Baghdad. And the wettest weeper and the loudest howler among the counter class will be the man, originally from Terre Haute, whose fond memories of the old hotel are limited to his being kicked out of from the free lunch counter in 1873. At this hotel, oh, always stopped Miss Maggie Brown. Mrs. Brown was a bony woman of 60, dressed in the rustiest black and carrying a handbag made apparently from the height of the original animal that Adam decided to call an alligator. She always occupied a small parlor and bedroom at the top of this hotel at the rent of $2 per day. And always when she was there, each day came hurrying to see her many men, sharp faced and anxious looking with only seconds to spare. For Maggie Brown was said to be the third richest woman in the world. And these solicitous gentlemen were only the city's wealthiest brokers and businessmen seeking trifling loans of oh, half, a half a dozen millions or so from the dingy old lady with the prehistoric handbag. The stenographer and typewriter of the Acropolis Hotel there, I've let the name out, was Miss Ida Bates. She was a holdover from the Greek classics. There wasn't a flaw in her looks. Some old timer paying his regards to a lady said, to have loved her was a liberal education. Well, even to have looked over the hair and the neat white shirtwaist of Miss Bates was equivalent to a full course of any correspondence school in the country. She sometimes did a little typewriting for me, and as she refused to take the money in advance, she came to look upon me as something of a friend and protege. She had an unfailing kindliness and good nature, and not even a fur importer had ever crossed, they had to cross the line of good behavior in her presence. The tire force of the Acropolis from the owner who lived in Vienna down to the head porter who had been bedridden for 16 years would have sprung to her defense in a moment. One day I, I walked past Miss Bates' little sanctum ribbing and thintorium and saw her in her place a black haired unit, unmistakably a person pounding with each of her fingers upon the keys. Musing on the mutability of temporal affairs, I passed on. The next day, I went on a two weeks vacation. <coughs> Returning, I strolled through the lobby of the Acropolis and saw with a little glow of old Lang Syne, Miss Bates. As Grecian and fine and flawless as ever, just putting the cover on her machine. The hour for closing had come, but she asked me to sit for a few minutes in the dictation chair. Miss Bates explained her absence and return to the Acropolis Hotel in words identical or similar to those following. Well, man, how are the stories coming? Pretty regularly, said I, and about equal when they're going. I'm sorry, she said, good typewriting writing is the main thing in the story. You've missed me, haven't you? No one, said I, whom I have ever known does, knows as well as you do how to space properly belt buckles, semicolons, hotel guests, and hairpins. But you've been away too. I saw a package of peppermint pepsin in your place the other day. Oh, I was going to tell you about it if you hadn't interrupted me. <laughs> well, of course, you know about Maggie Brown, who stops here. Well, she's worth about $40 million. 
She lives in Jersey at a $10 flat. She always has more cash on hand than half a dozen business candidates for vice president. I don't know whether she carries it in her stocking or not, but I know she's mighty popular in the part of the town where they worship the golden calf. Well, about two weeks ago, this Brown stops at the door and rubbers at me for 10 minutes. I'm sitting with my side to her, striking off some manifold copies of a copy of a copy of my proposition for a nice old man from Tacoma. But I always see everything around me. When I'm hard at work, I can see through things through my side combs. And I always leave one button unbuttoned in the back of my shirt waist so and see who's behind me. I didn't look around because I make from 18 to $20 a week and I didn't have to. That evening at knocking off time, she sends for me to come up to her apartment. <coughs> I expected to have to typewrite about 2000 words of note, notes of hand, liens and contracts with a 10, with a 10 cent tip in sight, but I went. Oh man, I was certainly surprised. Old Maggie Brown had turned human. Child said she, you're the most beautiful creature I ever saw in my life. I want you to quit your work with me and come with, live with me. I have no kith for kin, says she, except a husband and a, and a son or two. And I had, hold no communications with any of them. They're extravagant burdens for a hardworking woman. I want you to be a daughter to me. They say I'm stingy and mean, but the papers print lies about me doing my own cooking and washing. It's a lie, she goes on. I put my washing out, except for the handkerchiefs and stockings and petticoats and collars and light stuff like that. I've got $40 million in cash and stocks and bonds that are as negotiable as the standard oil preferred at a church fair. I'm a lonely old woman and I need companionship. You're the most beautiful human being I ever saw. Will you come and live with me? I'll show him whether, whether I can spend money or not, she says. <laughs> oh man, what would you have done? Well, of course I fell into it. And to tell you the truth, I began to like old Maggie. And it wasn't on account of, all, of the 40 millions and what she could do for me. I was kind of lonesome in the world too. Everybody's got to have somebody that they can explain to about the, the pain in their left shoulder or how fast patent leather shoes wear out when they begin to crack. You can't talk about such things to men you meet in hotels. They're looking for just such openings. So I gave up my job in the hotel and went with Mrs. Brown. I certainly seem to have a mash on her. She'd look at me for half an hour at a time when I was sitting, reading, or or looking at the magazines. One time I, I said to her, do I remind you of some deceased relative or friend of your childhood, Mrs. Brown? I know you give me a pretty good optical inspection from time to time. time, to time. You have a face, she says, exactly like a dear friend of mine, the best friend I ever had. But I like you for yourself, child, too. And say, man, what, what do you suppose she did? Loosened up like a Marcel wave and the surf at Coney. She took me to a swell dressmaker and gave me a la, gave her a la carte to fit me out. Money, no object. They were rush orders and Madame locked the front door and put the whole force to work. <coughs> then we moved to, what do you think? No, yes again. That's right, the Hotel Bonton. We had a six room apartment and it cost a hundred dollars a day. I saw the bill and I began to love that old lady. Oh. And then man, when my dresses came in, oh, couldn't you tell you about them? You couldn't understand. Then I began to call her Aunt Maggie. Well, you've read about Cinderella, of course. What Cinderella said when, when the prince fit, fit that Three and a half A on her foot was a hard luck story compared to the things I told myself. Then Aunt Maggie says she's going to give me a coming out banquet in the Bon Ton that will make all the moving vans of all the of all the Dutch families in Fifth Avenue. 
I've been out before, Aunt Maggie, says I, but I'll come out again. But you know, this is one of the swellest hotels in the city. And you know, pardon me, uh, pardon me, it's, it's hard to get a bunch of notables together unless you train for it. Don't fret about that, child, says Aunt Maggie. I don't send out invitations, I issue orders. I'll have 50 gifts here that couldn't be brought together again by any reception unless it was given by King Edward or, or William Travers Jerome. They are a man, of course, and all of them either owe me money or, or intend to. Some of their wives won't come, but a good many will. <laughs> oh, well, I, I wish you could have seen that banquet. The dinner service was all gold and cut glass. There were about 40 men and ladies present besides Aunt Maggie and I. You'd have never have known the third richest woman in the world. She had on a new black silk dress with so much pesantary on it that it sounded like a, a hailstone when I, I heard once when I was staying all night with a girl that lived in a top floor studio. And my dress, oh, man, I can't waste the words on you. It was all handmade lace, whether there was any of, of it at all. And it cost $300. <coughs> That's all the bill. The men were all bald-headed or white side-whiskered. And they kept a running fire of light repartee, about 3% in Byron and the cotton crop. On the left of me was something that talked like a banker. And the, on my right was a young fellow who said he was a newspaper artist. Oh, he was the only, well, I was going to tell you. <coughs> After the dinner was over, Mrs. Brown and I went up to the apartment. We had to squeeze our way through a mob of reporters all the way through the halls. That's one of the things money does for you. Say, do you know a newspaper artist named Lathrop? Tall man with nice eyes and an easy way of talking? No. Uh, I don't remember what paper he works on. Oh, all right. Well, when we got upstairs, Mrs. Brown telephones for the bill right away. It came. It was $600. Aunt Maggie fainted. I got her on the lounge and opened the beadwork. Child, says she when she came back to the world, what, what, what was it? A raise of rent or an income tax? Just a little dinner, says I, nothing to worry about, hardly a drop in, in the bucket shop. Sit up and take notice, <coughs> the dispossessed notice, if there's no other kind. But say, man, do, do you know what Aunt Maggie did? She got cold feet. She hustled at me out of the hotel Bonton at, at nine the next morning. We went to her rooming house on the Lower East Side. She went. She rented one room that had water on the floor below and, and light on the floor above. Late after we got moved all, all of our things, all you could see of the room was about $1,500 worth of swell dresses and a one burner gas stove. Aunt Maggie had had a sudden attack, attack of the hedges. I guess everybody has to go on a spree once in their lives. A man spends on his highballs. A woman gets woozy on, on clothes. But we're $40 million, say. I'd like to have a picture of, but speaking of pictures, did you ever run across a newspaper artist named Lathrop? Uh, tall, oh, oh, I asked you that before, didn't I? He was mighty nice to me at the dinner. His voice just suited me. I guess he just thought I was, I was going to inherit some of Aunt Maggie's money. Well, Mr. Mr. Man, three days of that light housekeeping was plenty for me. Aunt Maggie was as affectionate as ever. She hardly ever let me out of her sight. But let me tell you, she was a hedger from Hedgersville, Hedger County. 75 cents a day was the limit she spent. We cooked our own meals in that room. There I was in a thousand dollars worth of the latest thing in clothes, doing stunts over a one burner gas stove. 
As I say, on the third day, I flew the coop. I couldn't stand for, for, for throwing together another 15 cent kidney stew while wearing at the same time a $150 house dress. So I goes to the closet and puts on the cheapest dress Mrs. Brown had bought for me. It's the one I've got on now. It's not so bad for $75, is it? I had left all of my own clothes at my sister's flat in Brooklyn. Mrs. Brown, formerly Aunt Maggie, says I to her, I am going to extend my feet alternatively, one after the other, in such a matter and direction as this tenement will recede from me in the quickest, in the quickest possible time. I am no worshiper of money, says I, but there are some things I can not stand. I can stand the fabulous monster that I've read about that blows hot birds and cold bottles in the same breath. But I can't stand a quitter. They say you've got $40 million. Well, you'll never have any of the less. And I was beginning to like you. <coughs> well, the late Aunt Maggie kicks till the tears flow. She offers to move into a swell room with a two burner stove and running water. I've spent an awful lot of money, child. We'll have to economize for a while. You're the most beautiful creature I ever laid eyes on, she says, and I won't, don't want you to leave me. Well, you see, don't you? I walked straight to the Acropolis and asked for my job back, and I got it. Now, how do you say some of your writings were getting along? I know you've lost out some by not having me to typewrite them. Ever have them illustrated? Oh, by the way, did you ever happen to know a newspaper artist? Oh, shut up. I, I know you asked it before. I wonder what paper he works for. It's funny, but I couldn't help but thinking he isn't, wasn't thinking about the money he might have been thinking I was thinking I'd get from old Maggie Brown. If only if I knew some of the newspaper editors, I sound of an easy footstep came from the doorway. Either Bates saw who it was through her black, her back hair comb. I saw her turn pink, perfect statue that, that she was, a miracle that I share with Pygmalion only. Am I excusable? She, she said to me, adorable petitioner that she became. It's Mr. Lathrop. I wonder if it was, it really wasn't the money or I wonder if at all he, of course, I was invited to the wedding. After the ceremony, I dragged Lathrop aside. You're an artist, and, and you haven't figured out why Maggie Brown conceived such a strong liking for Miss Bates. That, that was. Let me show you. The bride wore a simple white dress as beautifully draped as the costumes of, of the ancient Greeks. I took some leaves from one of the decorative wreaths in the little parlor and made a chaplet of them and put them on the lady's shining chestnut hair and made her turn profile to her husband. By Jingo, he said, isn't Ida's head a dead ringer for, for the lady's head on the silver dollar? And that's the enchanted profile. Oh, well, looks like we've two stories. That's not bad for today. So, on behalf of Library, oh, Henry and myself, thanks for coming. And we'll see you next week, same time. Thank you.